that your Holy Spirit would rest upon each one of us here, that you would speak to us. You know where every person is today, the struggles they've been through this week and the trials of life. And pray that you would bring encouragement, healing, deliverance, blessing, and salvation to each person here as needed. I pray against any spirit of evil and just ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon us to speak truth. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you happen to be a guest, we did start a series just a few weeks ago that I entitled, When the Church Fails. And what we're doing is looking at the reality that the church as it exists in this world is not a perfect entity. That is, the church is God's creation. Christ himself said that he would build his church. It was his plan. And the church exists throughout the world because of his work. However, because of the problems of human flesh that we're all struggling to work out our salvation and we're still wrestling with our own sin issues, there are problems in the church from time to time. And sometimes those problems affect us personally and maybe many of you feel like the church has failed you at some point. And in order to address this, we started by first defining the church. It's not some organization. It's not just the pastor, preacher, whatever. It's not a building or structure. The church is made up of all those people who are true believers. That is, if you have accepted Christ and you know him personally then you are a member of the universal church throughout the world. There are lots of people who attend churches who aren't members of the true church because they've never come to know Christ. And the church is this body that is to perform the work of Christ throughout the world. However, we've been talking that the church fails really in two primary areas. First, we fail Christ, and then secondly, we fail each other. Particularly last week, we were talking about some of the ways in which the church fails Christ. Now, I know for most of us, we're more concerned about how the church fails us. But really, from the large picture of our purpose in this world and the purpose of the church itself, there is this greater question of how does the church fail Christ? And so we were looking last week in the book of Revelation at the church that was at Ephesus at the time. And John, now who had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, he had been given this word that he was to share with the church at Ephesus. And the word was simply this, that God knew their deeds, that he knew their hard work, their perseverance. He knew also that they couldn't tolerate false teachers or wicked men who were bringing false doctrine. So they they worked hard, they stood for truth, but they had a problem. Now, before we go a little bit further, we could say about any church or many churches today that this could be true. That is, that any church, any group of believers could have lots of good deeds and could stand firm for truth and still have an underlying problem. And as I said when we began to address these particular churches in Ephesus, there there are seven little messages there, but they're really messages not just for those seven cities, those churches in those seven cities, but to the church for all time. And we are a subset of the universal church, that is this group of people that meet here and call ourselves Celebration. And this could be a message to us or to any other subset of the universal church. And so... It is that the problem they had was this, that even though they had persevered and endured and so forth, they had forsaken their first love. In other words, their religious duties or their church activities had become some routine that they went through, and their heart was not in it. Now, this could be true for any of us any time, could it not? That we could go through the routine of religion We could check off the box, so to speak, that I went to church this week or did some other things that you think would satisfy God. But in reality, at the core, your heart could be cold. And so we listed last week when we were talking about this six different possibilities as to why one might forsake their love of God. The first is what I alluded to. It's just religion. Religion is man's attempt to control God and control other men. It's going through certain duties and activities and legalistic requirements, but it's not about relationship. And if I'm just doing a religious thing, it might be that my heart is cold. 
It might be that I'm complacent, that I've neglected my relationship with God in the same way that I might neglect my relationship with my spouse. Could be that sinful temptations have come my way and caused me to be diverted and my heart is more concerned about them than about God himself. When I talked about disagreement, I was talking about The idea that you might be in disagreement with God about the pattern or path of your life. In other words, what you had planned and what hopes you had, they probably didn't work out. And you've gone down courses and avenues in life that you think, boy, I wish it hadn't been this way. And as a consequence, your heart can grow bitter or cold toward God because life is not the way that you would like it to be. Then we said you might turn in in ultimate rebellion against God, that you're outside of his will, clearly in rebellion, and obviously your heart would be cold. And the last we talked about was spiritual deception, that any one of us can fall prey to deception at any point in time that leads us in a direction that would cause our heart to grow cold. Now, I want to continue to talk about this this week in this idea of the church failing, particularly with these messages to the churches that are recorded there in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And so, the first is this. It's the church at Sardis. If you were here last week, I had a little map. All of these churches are, were located fairly close to each other in what today would be Turkey. And like Ephesus was a coastal city, it was a place of commerce and so forth. Sardis was not that far away from Ephesus. And in this case, again, the message is, I know your deeds. In other words, God sees what's going on in that church, that body of believers. But he says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Now, as I said, all of these recordings here in Revelation are warnings to the churches at that time, but also to us. That any given group of believers could have a reputation for being alive, but be spiritually dead. Now probably, in some way or another, many of you have seen that or experienced that. For example, if you went back and looked at the history of most private colleges in this country, the vast majority of them were founded by Christians. I mean, like the oldest university in the country is Harvard. It was founded by Christians. The doctrine of that university was clearly Christian, yet today it is a purely secular university. Even the seminary there is essentially a universalist place where there's no real pure doctrine. And so here was an institution that started with life, that spiritually today, now it has a great reputation, but spiritually... There's no life there. And you could find that's the case with many private colleges and universities that started with a strong spiritual fervor. They have developed a reputation that has been maintained in some way or another, but spiritually there's no life there. And you see, this could be true not only for a, 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 an academic institution, it certainly can be true for churches. I am confident there are lots of churches today that are active and there's no real life there. There's no place to go and find sustenance that comes from the real Spirit of God. For example, many years ago when my wife and I were engaged, we were looking for a place to be married in her hometown of Cleveland, well, really Strongsville, Ohio, right outside Cleveland. She hadn't really lived there in a while, so she didn't really have a home church, and we were just considering different places, so we visited a few. And one was a a denominational church. I won't mention the denomination, but we walked into this place, and I remember feeling like I had walked into a high school cafeteria. I mean, it just, just had this sense of being a building, and there was no life in it. It was stale. And it just struck me in a weird way, and we were like, this is not the place. And we went around to others, and we went to this nice little church in Berea, Ohio. And we walked in there, and when we walked in, it was like, ah. It was like the Spirit of the the Lord was present. 
Now, interestingly enough, we did choose to get married in the place in Berea, and, and there was a, just a fervor there, a spiritual fervor, which I would credit to. I didn't know the people there, but I would credit to people there who really knew him, who were praying people, who worshipped him, and as a consequence, there was this, just this peace in this place where they worshipped. And would you believe today in the, in the other church, the first one that I referred to, that it no longer exists. In fact, a cult actually has their services in that same building today. There was no life there, and that church died, and what came up after it was a weed, in essence. And you see, it reflects something about what's going on there spiritually. And see, now, any given church can have a reputation but be dead. And, you know, there is a warning in these, these messages in Revelation that they're not just for other churches, they are for us. Because we could have a reputation for being alive and there not be real life there. That we've gone through the routine, that we rely upon ourselves and our abilities and things like that, rather than upon Christ and his work. And you know, that's not only true for academic institutions and churches, it can be true for individuals. Do you know, I've known three people now, one of whom was a pastor, who had been in churches for years and later came to know Christ. Now, you heard me correctly. One of them was a pastor. That is, he was pastoring a church and later realized he never knew Christ personally. He had been going through the motions, doing it out of his own flesh. And then came to know him and publicly admitted this was the case. And you see, there can be a, an image or a portrayal of life and no real life. And the obvious question to every person here is, where do you stand? Do you truly know him? Has the Spirit come to dwell within you? Is there life in you that you are then giving to others? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and there is life that comes from his presence. And it comes through you into the lives of others. Now the other church that I want to talk about that's very related is this, I'm skipping over just a little. It's Laodicea. Because there is this reality to what's going on at Sardis and Laodicea that are very related. Because in this case, the statement to the church is this. Again, I know your deeds... Now, does that ever make you a bit uncomfortable, the reality that God knows all of the actions that you undertake, all of the words that you say? I mean, the Scripture even says that we will give an account for every careless word. So clearly, he has an awareness of everything in our lives. In this case, he's making the statement to the church here at Laodicea that he knows their deeds. But he says this, that you are neither hot or cold. He says, I wish you were one or the other. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now the question arises as to, why is this significant, being hot, cold, or lukewarm? Well, obviously the hot part is pretty clear. If you, if you genuinely know him, there is warmth, real warmth in that relationship. So obviously he would desire that every person would be hot in terms of relationship with him. But why is it that he would rather you be cold than lukewarm? Well, I would say this, that lukewarm has the pretension of or appearance of religion but has no life. In other words, I could be a church-going person. I could have the appearance of life, as with the prior church at Sardis, and be dead. And in fact, I think it's a bit more dangerous. Some people will say, well, you know, what about all the people who are born in cultures where they're dominated by Islam or Hinduism or something like that? How are they going to come to know Christ? You know, I think against the backdrop, a backdrop that is 
a great contrast. It is easier to see the truth than in one where it's somewhat muddied. You see, because if you're going to profess Christ in a starkly Islamic area, it is because the Spirit of the Lord has drawn you and your heart is such that you have humbled yourself to Him and you know there are risks associated with that. However, in a culture like ours, you can purport to be a church-going person. You can even talk about God publicly, but you can be lukewarm without really knowing him. And it can be socially acceptable. Now, if you get out of control talking about Christ or about Jesus himself, then likely you're going to get rebuked in some way. But, but you can be a spiritual person or a person who believes in a God and be very, very lukewarm and it be acceptable in our culture. Now, not quite as acceptable as it was a few decades ago, but nonetheless, you can easily be lukewarm in this environment. And you see, it might be better that your heart is cold than to be lukewarm because your prospect for coming to know the truth is actually greater. If I'm pretending to be something that I'm not, then I might deceive myself, sort of like the person who believes his own lies. And in fact, the next part of the scripture says this. And I believe this is the most important part that I wanted to talk about, and I believe that it's the most significant for every one of us. Because he has said, you are lukewarm, and your reason is this. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. That the reason for being lukewarm is because the church there, this group of believers, think that they are wealthy and that they have no needs. And so they have been deceived by the things of this world into thinking that they're in a good place rather than depending upon Christ. Now, if there is any warning for the churches that are in this country, it has to be this. I mean, in general, I think it's a fair assessment to say that if you took all of the churches of this country and you sort of averaged them out, we would be smack dab in the middle of lukewarm. I mean, really, as a nation, spiritually, we are lukewarm. When a crisis occurs, suddenly we're praying and we need God and we sing God bless America. But most of the time, we're too comfortable. And really, the reason we're too comfortable is exactly the reason that is given to the church here at Laodicea. That we think we are rich, but in fact, we are in poverty. See, he says, you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, here's the problem. Wealth, or the appearance of wealth, can temporarily numb any person to the reality of life. Now, the key words there are really temporarily, and you might, I said numb, you might replace that with blind. In other words, wealth can temporarily blind you to the reality of life because I can acquire things and I can make my life comfortable and I can give myself a sense of security in the things that I have maybe in property and and other things and, and the wealth that I rely upon. But it is a deception to believe that therein lies life. Recently, I was in a place that's a very, very nice place, somewhat ritzy in an environment. And um, I don't know, my son and I were just having a conversation, and he made this comment that I thought was a good insight. He said, It seems fake. In other words, wealth had created an environment that gave the appearance of being 
perfect or wonderful. And he said, it seems fake. There's nobody here that needs any help. When in reality, people who need help are essentially everywhere. And see, there is a very, very serious danger that wealth can deceive us into thinking that this is life, whatever I have defined it to be, rather than relying upon Christ. Now, as I'm saying this, some of you are probably saying, well, that's all good and nice, but I'm not wealthy. Well, according to the statistics I've seen, if you have food, clothing, and shelter, adequate food, clothing, and shelter, you are wealthier than 80% of the world's population. See, we, we in our culture, we don't think of ourselves often as wealthy because what? We compare ourselves to somebody else. But in comparison to the world, basically most people who come to be a part of this church would be wealthy. Now we have some people who have genuine needs. We try to help them with their needs. But most of us do not have needs. Now we have lots of wants, true. But most of us do not have needs. And see, if you have food, clothing, and shelter, and discretionary income where you can take vacations and do recreational things, then you're wealthier than 90-some percent of the world's population. So really, in reality, most people around the world would consider us wealthy. And I do believe that wealth has largely deceived this nation into believing that wealth in and of itself is a goal or a purpose. When in fact you could have all of the accoutrements of wealth and have no life. Have emptiness. And it's a real danger for all of us. See, let us suppose that for a short period of time, let's say two or three years, you had to go and live like in the conditions that Vicki Adundo and her kids live in in Kenya, the lady who's been here who has the homeless uh, shelter. She has kids, uh, about 60 kids or something like that, 50 kids that were homeless and she's taken them in and she's like the mama to all of them. Now, they have a bare amount of food Sometimes they forego meals. They have shelter because people helped them. They were homeless. They have very little extra. And in fact, uh, Melinda Upchurch, our children's minister, went there just a couple months ago. And while there, others helped support her and they helped pay the electric bill and things like that. For a long time, they didn't even have electricity. They paid that up now. But let's say that you had to go and live there and you had zero technology and you had maybe just a couple pieces of extra clothing and you had to work each day essentially from an agricultural standpoint to make sure that you had adequate food and you had to live that way for the next two or three years. Now what would that do for your spiritual life? Really, now, if, if you were picked up and taken and you lived with Vicki and her kids, what would that do for your spiritual life? Well, I would say it would do one of two things. You would be crabby and grouchy, sort of like I am every morning for the first 10 minutes of the day. We have an unwritten rule at my house. You don't speak for the first 10 minutes or so. You just got to give me time to get the cobwebs out. You might become angry and bitter and say, God, why have you put me in this place? True. Why have you made me go through this? Or you might become one who is closer to Christ, more thankful, less distracted by the things of the world, And realize that relationship with him and relationship with people, those things are more important than all of the things that I had. And see, really, we're in a culture where people, I think, are overwhelmed, essentially, with stuff. 
with wealth. And it largely deceives us or takes us away from that which is most important. I would think that all of us, if we are honest and assessed our own lives, could probably identify areas in which something associated with wealth or the things that I own, acquire, whatever it might be, that those things in some way or another take part of my life away from what is more important. Focusing upon those, dealing with those, takes away from some of the things that are more important. Now, I understand this area pretty well because I think I was completely deceived as a young man. I made it my goal to acquire and to prosper and be wealthy because I thought somehow there was life in that. I later realized there was a lot of emptiness in that. But you see, I do recognize that that goal or that purpose robbed, at least for some time period, robbed me of a genuine meaning in life because I had the wrong path, the wrong goal, the wrong purpose. And see, one of the problems in American Christianity is we've tried to merge the two. I mean, you can find in segments of Christianity essentially those who would teach that God is your genie whose only purpose is to make you wealthy. Now, if you seek him with all of your heart, inevitably he will bless you. This is the nature of God. But the condition of your heart is what's most important. And you see, what is being said here is that for these folks at Laodicea, the condition of their heart is lukewarm. And they have this comfort in their wealth that deceives them and keeps their heart from burning with passion for Christ. And so he warns him, he says, look, you are really, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. You are missing that which is most important. He goes on to say, he said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now, the scripture talks about the refiner's fire. It is the work of Christ in each of our lives. That he refines us often by taking us through the trials and difficulties of life. And we really attempt to acquire wealth to avoid those. That somehow it will insulate me from having to go through problems. But he says this goal, which is refined by him, that, that it clothes us really with purity and with righteousness and gives us real life. Now, he even says that I rebuke and discipline those that I love. In other words, he's saying to this church at Laodicea that there is a, a rebuke coming your way or there is discipline coming your way in order that you might turn away from your lukewarm approach and that your hearts might burn with passion for truth. He says, come listen, open your heart, anyone who hears my voice and invites me in that he will come and be with them. And like with the other statements there, he says, anyone who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That it's a statement to all of us today. Now I would ask, if you're honest, to what extent has or does wealth keep you lukewarm? In other words, if you had to give up many of the things that you've acquired, whatever it might be, what would it do to your spiritual life? Now, I do believe that there are people that God has blessed with wealth because they are people who have learned to be extraordinarily generous. But if I'm holding on tightly to the things that I've acquired in life, probably those things control me more than I control them. But if I've learned to be a generous con uh, giver, one who's happy and overflowing in blessing others, 
then maybe I've learned that the things of this world are just something that pass through quickly. But there is a stern warning that these things of this world can cause me to be spiritually lukewarm. And that is a very dangerous place. One in which he would spit us out rather than invite us in. So I would encourage you to examine your own heart in this area. Not just today, but in the days, weeks, months ahead. That I would invite the Spirit to speak to me wherever there is a place where wealth or the things of this world might deceive me about what is most important in life. Let's pray. Lord, for any person here who is in bondage to the things of this world, whether it's money or property or other assets, whatever it might be, where things of this world own us, I pray that there would be liberty, that we would be set free to be generous people who meet the needs of others. Lord, I pray for all of us that the deception of wealth would would not encumber our lives, but rather that we would know that life is in you and you alone. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.